Obesity and overeating have joined sex as central issues in the lives of many women today. In the United States, 50% of women are estimated to be overweight. Every women's magazine has a diet column. Diet doctors and clinics flourish. The names of diet foods are now part of our general vocabulary. Physical fitness and beauty are every woman's goals. While this preoccupation with fat and food has become so common that we tend to take it for granted, being fat, feeling fat, and the compulsion to overeat are, in fact, serious and painful experiences for the woman involved. Being fat isolates and invalidates a woman. Almost inevitably, the explanations offered for the fatness point a finger at the failure of women themselves to control their weight, control their appetites, and control their impulses. Women suffering from the problem of compulsive overeating endure a double anguish, feeling out of step with the rest of society, and believing that it is all their own fault. The number of women who have problems with weight and compulsive eating is large and growing. Owing to the emotional distress involved and the fact that the many varied solutions offered to women in the past have not worked, a new psychotherapy to deal with compulsive eating has had to evolve within the context of the movement for women's liberation. This new psychotherapy represents feminist rethinking of traditional psychoanalysis. A psychoanalytic approach has much to offer toward a solution to compulsive eating problems. It provides ways for exploring the roots of such problems in early experiences. It shows us how we develop our adult personalities, most importantly our sexual identity, how a female baby becomes a girl and then a woman, and how a male baby becomes a boy and then a man. Psychoanalytic insight helps us to understand what getting fat and overeating mean to individual women by explaining their conscious or unconscious acts. An approach based exclusively on classical psychoanalysis without a feminist perspective is, however, inadequate. Since the Second World War, psychiatry has, by and large, told unhappy women that their discontent represents an inability to resolve the Oedipal constellation. Female fatness has been diagnosed as an obsessive compulsive symptom related to separation, individuation, narcissism, and insufficient ego development. Being overweight is seen as a deviance and anti-men. Overeating and obesity have been reduced to character defects rather than perceived as the full expression of pain and conflicting experiences. Furthermore, rather than attempting to uncover and confront women's bad feelings about their bodies or toward food, professionals concern themselves with the problem of how to get the women thin. So after the psychiatrists, analysts, and clinical psychologists proved unsuccessful, experimental workers looked for biological and even genetic reasons for obesity. None of these approaches has had convincing, lasting results. None of them has addressed the central issues of compulsive eating which are rooted in the social inequality of women. A feminist perspective to the problem of women's compulsive eating is essential if we are to move on from the ineffective, blame the victim approach and the unsatisfactory adjustment model to treatment. While psychoanalysis gives us useful tools to discover the deepest sources of emotional distress, fe feminism insists that those painful personal experiences derive from the social context into which female babies are born and within which they develop to become adult women. The fact that compulsive eating is overwhelmingly a woman's problem suggests that it has something to do with the experience of being female in our society. Feminism argues that being fat represents an attempt to free, to break free of society's sex stereotypes. Getting fat can thus be understood as a definite and purposeful act. It is a directed, conscious or unconscious, challenge to sex role stereotyping and culturally defined experience of womanhood. Fat is a social disease and fat is a feminist issue. Fat is not about lack of self-control or lack of willpower. That is about protection, sex, nurturance, strength, mothering, boundaries. substance, assertion, and rage. It is a response to the inequality of the sexes. Fat expresses experiences of women today in ways that are seldom examined and even more seldom treated. While becoming fat does not alter the roots of sexual oppression, 
an examination of the underlying causes or unconscious motivations that lead women to compulsive eating suggests new treatment possibilities. Unlike most weight-reducing schemes, our new therapeutic approach does not reinforce the oppressive social roles that lead women into compulsive eating in the first place. What is it about the social position of women that leads them to respond to it by getting fat? The current ideological justification for inequality of the sexes has been built on the concept of the innate differences between women and men. Women alone can give birth to and breastfeed their infants and, as a result, a primary dependency relationship develops between mother and child. While this biological capacity is the only known genetic difference between men and women, it is used as the basis on which to divide unequally women and men's labor, power, roles, and expectations. The division of labor has become institutionalized. Women's capacity to reproduce and provide nourishment has relegated her to the care and socialization of children. The relegation of women to the social roles of wife and mother has had several significant consequences that contribute to the problem of getting fat. First, in order to become a wife and mother, the woman has to have a man. Getting a man is presented as an almost unattainable and yet essential goal. To get a man, a woman has to learn to regard herself as an item, a commodity, a sex object. Much of her experience and identity depends on how she and others see her. As John Berger says in Ways of Seeing, men act and women appear. Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. This determines not only most relations between men and women, but also the relation of women to themselves. This emphasis on presentation as the central aspect of a woman's existence makes her extremely self-conscious. It demands that she occupy herself with a self-image that others will find pleasing and attractive, an image that will immediately convey what kind of woman she is. She must observe and evaluate herself, scrutinizing every detail of herself as though she were an outside judge. She attempts to make herself in the image of womanhood presented by billboards, newspapers, magazines, and television. The media present women either in a sexual context or within the family, reflecting a woman's two prescribed roles, first as a sex object and then as a mother. She is brought up to marry by catching a man with her good looks and pleasing manner. To do this, she must look appealing, earthy, sensual, sexual, virginal, innocent, reliable, daring, mysterious, coquettish, and thin. In other words, she offers her self-image on the marriage marketplace. As a married woman, her sexuality will be sanctioned and her economic needs will be looked after. She will have achieved the first step of womanhood. Since women are taught to see themselves for the outside as candidates for men, they become prey to the huge fashion and diet industries that first set up the ideal images and then exhort women to meet them. The message is loud and clear. The woman's body is not her own. The woman's body is not satisfactory as it is. It must be thin, free of unwanted hair, deodorized, perfumed, and clothed. It must conform to an ideal physical type. Family and school socialization teaches girls to groom themselves properly. Furthermore, the job is never-ending, for the image changes from year to year. In the early 1960s, the only way to feel acceptable was to be skinny and flat-chested with long, straight hair. The first of these was achieved by near starvation, the second by binding one's breasts with an ace bandage, and the third by ironing one's hair. Then, in the early 1970s, the look was curly hair and full breasts. Just as styles and clothes change seasonally, so women's bodies are expected to change to fit these fashions. Long and skinny one year, petite and demure the next, women are continually manipulated by images of proper womanhood, which are extremely powerful because they are presented as the only reality. To ignore them means to risk being an outcast. Women are urged to conform, to help out the economy by continuous consumption of goods and clothing that are quickly made unwearable by the next season's fashion styles in clothes and body shapes. In the background, a $10 billion industry waits to remold bodies to the latest fashion. In this way, women are caught in an attempt to conform 
to a standard that is externally defined and constantly changing. But these models of femininity are experienced by women as unreal, frightening, and unattainable. They produce a picture that is far removed from the reality of women's day-to-day -day lives. The one constant in these images is that a woman must be thin. For many women, compulsive eating and being fat have become one way to avoid marketed or seen as the being marketed or seen as the ideal woman. My fat says, screw you to all the men who want me to be the perfect mom, sweetheart, maiden, whore, or take me for what I really am, not for who I'm supposed to be. If you're really interested in me, you can wade through the layers and find out who I am. In this way, fat expresses a rebellion against the powerlessness of what women against the pressure to look and act in a certain way, and against being evaluated on her ability to create an image for herself. Becoming fat is, thus, a woman's response to the first step in the process of fulfilling a prescribed social role which requires her to shape herself to an externally imposed image in order to catch a man. But a second stage in this process takes place after she achieves that first goal, after she has become a wife and a mother. For a mother, everyone else's needs must come first. Mothers are the unpaid managers of small, essential, complex, and demanding organizations. They may not control the financial arrangements of this micro-corporation or the major decisions on the location or capital expenditure, but they do generally control the day-to-day -day operations. For her work, the mother works, and for her keep, the mother works an estimated 10 hours a day, 18 if she has a second job outside the home making sure that the food is purchased and prepared, the children's clothes, toys, and books are in place, and that the father's effects are at the ready. She makes the house habitable, clean and comfy. She does the social secretarial work of arranging for the family to spend time with relatives and friends. She provides a babysitting and chauffeur escort service for her children. As babies and children, we are all cared for. As adults, however, Women are expected to feed and clean not only their babies, but also their husbands, and only then, themselves. In this role, women experience particular pressure over food and eating. After the birth of each baby, breast or bottle becomes a major issue. The woman is often made to feel insecure about her adequacy to perform her fundamental job. In the hospital, the baby is weighed after each feed to see if the mother's breasts have enough milk. Pediatricians and baby care books bombard the new mother with authoritative but conflicting advice about, for example, scheduled versus demand feeding, composition of the formula, or introduction of solid foods. As her children grow older, a woman continues to be reminded that her feeding skills are inadequate. To the tune of billions of dollars a year, the food industry counsels her on how, when, and what she should feed her charges. The advertisements cajole her into providing nutritious, nutritious breakfasts, munchy snacks, and wholesome dinners. Media preoccupation with good housekeeping and particularly with good food and good feeding serves as a yardstick by which to measure the mother's ever-failing performance. This preoccupation colonizes food preparation so that the housewife is presented with a list of do's and don'ts so contradictory that it is a wonder that anything gets produced in the kitchen at all. It is not surprising that a woman quickly learns not to trust her own impulses, either in feeding her family or in listening to her own needs when she feeds herself.